an air-launched rocket, built by Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit reached orbit for the first time on January 17. The 21 meters two-stage Launcher 1 rocket, capable of delivering up to 500 kilograms to orbit, took off from California's Mojave Air and Spaceport on its second powered test flight, called Launch Demo 2. The rocket left the ground beneath the wing of its Boeing 747 carrier plane, known as Cosmic Girl. About an hour after liftoff, the 747 jumbo jet entered a steep climb of more than 25 degrees, and the aircraft's two pilots and two launch engineers readied the rocket for release. At an altitude of roughly 10,700 meters, Launcher 1 separated from the Cosmic Girl. The pumps inside the rocket's Newton 3 main engine spun up to ignite the vehicle's first stage and accelerated it toward the southeast over the Pacific. Burning kerosene combined with liquid oxygen, the main engine generated 327 kilonewtons of thrust during its three-minute burn to booster the rocket out of the atmosphere. The rocket's upper stage separated successfully and fired its Newton 4 engine as planned, and the vehicle slipped into orbit around our planet. Later the payload fairing got separated from the vehicle, exposing the satellites to the vacuum of space. About 45 minutes after its first burn, the Newton 4 blazed up again to raise the vehicle to an altitude of 500 kilometers. Shortly after that, the upper stage deployed the 10 tiny satellites provided by different university groups and NASA's Ames Research Center. Thus, Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 became the second air-launched rocket to put satellites into orbit, following the solid-fueled Pegasus launch vehicle developed by Orbital Sciences Corporation. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket was launched on a record eighth flight on Wednesday to send a new fleet of the company's Starlink Internet satellites into orbit. The Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from the launch pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, carrying 60 new Starlink satellites for SpaceX's growing constellation in orbit. The launch came after two days of delay due to poor weather. Two and a half minutes after liftoff, the first stage got separated from the upper stage and began its journey towards Earth. Six minutes later, the Falcon 9's first stage landed on one of SpaceX's drone ships in the Atlantic Ocean in a smooth touchdown. One hour after lifting off from Kennedy Space Center, the 60 Starlink satellites got separated from the vehicle's upper stage, completing the first Starlink mission of 2021. This puts the total Starlink constellation size to 1,000, as the company has expanded its beta access program for the service to the UK and Canada. The booster of this launch has flown seven times before, including just in December, when it was used to deliver a Sirius XM satellite to orbit, marking one of SpaceX's shortest turnaround times between flights. The launch was also noteworthy because it included a landing attempt under the envelope expansion conditions, meaning that the winds in the landing zone, where the SpaceX recovery ship was positioned, surpassed the company's previously established safety window to allow a landing attempt. The launch also marked the 102nd flight of the Falcon 9 rocket and the 72nd successful landing for the company. Elon Musk tweeted on Thursday that he will be donating $100 million towards a prize for best carbon capture technology. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO didn't provide any specifics beyond the tweet, but added that he would provide details next week. Carbon capture utilization and storage or sequestration, which is often shortened to carbon capture, involves capturing carbon dioxide to either store or reuse, to prohibit it from entering the atmosphere. Excess carbon dioxide gases block heat from escaping the Earth's atmosphere and cause global warming. Since the Industrial Revolution, human activity has increased atmospheric carbon dioxide by 47 percent and is the most important contributor to climate change. To combat it, carbon capture technology has become a focus for many trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. There are currently 21 large-scale carbon capture commercial projects worldwide, the first of which began in 1972. So far carbon capture has been a disappointment and had only a limited impact on global carbon dioxide emissions. While the context isn't completely clear yet, it seems evident that Musk is once again prepared to contribute significant funding towards technology that offers the potential to help the environment. Rocket Lab successfully launched a communications satellite for a German company, OHB Group, in the year's first Electron mission. A two-stage Electron booster lifted off from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1 at New Zealand on Wednesday, carrying a single microsatellite to orbit. The mission dubbed, Another One Leaves the Crust, scrubbed the original launch attempt four days earlier because of strange data from a sensor. 
The mission's payload has been kept secret since the Rocket Lab announced its planned launch on January 5th. The OHB did not disclose the name of the satellite until liftoff and did not include the mass or orbital height of the satellite in the press kit for the mission. The company only said that the satellite was going into orbit at an inclination of 90 degrees. After analyzing the rocket's payload fairing, experts speculated that the name of the satellite was GMST. Also, the word BIU printed on the fairing refers to bring into use, a term in satellite communications, for the first use of spectrum allocated by the International Telecommunication Union and national regulators. 70 minutes after liftoff, the Electron's upper stage released the satellite into the intended orbit. In a statement after the launch, OHB described GMST as a 50 kg class satellite, placed in an orbit 1,200 km high. The company described the satellite as the first prototype spacecraft for a planned new multi-hundred telecommunication satellite constellation in low Earth orbit. Once it's up and running, the satellite will enable specific frequencies to support future services from orbit. The launch was the 18th mission overall for the 18 meters tall Electron rocket, which has been providing dedicated rides for small satellites since 2018. Northrop Grumman announced on January 21 that it completed a static fire of one of the strap-on solid booster developed for United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan Centaur rocket. The test fire of the 2.2 meters long and 160 centimeters diameter graphite epoxy motor 63XL took place at the company's facility in Utah. Earlier in August 2020, the motor completed the first ground test fire at a cold temperature of about 4 degrees Celsius in a qualification test. On Thursday, the motor which was conditioned to a temperature of about 32 degrees Celsius was fired in a validation ground test to prepare for the actual flight. During the test, the motor fired for approximately 90 seconds, producing nearly 2,000 kilonewtons of thrust. The firing verified the motor's internal insulation, propellant grain ballistics, and nozzle performance. The booster is designed to hold 48,000 kilograms of solid propellant and has a nozzle diameter of 1.6 meters at the exit. According to Northrop Grumman, the new booster variant is expected to increase thrust and performance by 15 to 20 percent, compared to a standard GEM-63 solid motor. The booster will power the Vulcan Centaur launch vehicle, which is planned to carry the Peregrine lander to the moon for astrobotic technology on its first flight. NASA flight engineers Michael Hopkins and Victor Glover, who flew to the space station aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon Resilience spacecraft, will conduct two spacewalks in the upcoming weeks. The January 27 spacewalk will focus on completing cable and antenna rigging for the Bartolomeo Science Payloads platform, outside the European Space Agency's Columbus module. The duo will also configure a KA band terminal to enable an independent, high bandwidth communication link to European ground stations. After completing the upgrades on the Columbus module, Hopkins and Glover will remove a grapple fixture bracket on the far port truss in preparation for future power system upgrades. The February 1 spacewalk will address a variety of tasks, including installation of a final lithium-ion battery adapter plate on the port 4 truss that will wrap up battery replacement work begun in January 2017. Hopkins and Glover will remove another grapple fixture bracket on the same truss segment, replace an external camera on the starboard truss, and install a new high-definition camera on the Destiny Laboratory. They will also replace components for the Japanese robotic arms camera system outside the Kaibo module. Hopkins will be extravehicular crew member one for both spacewalks, wearing a spacesuit with red stripes, and Glover will be extravehicular crew member two, wearing a spacesuit with no stripes. These will be the third and fourth spacewalks in Hopkins' career, and the first and second for Glover. The mission marks 233rd and 234th spacewalks in support of space station assembly maintenance and upgrades since 1998. Now, let us discuss some of the major SpaceX Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX's latest flightworthy Starship prototype, serial number 9, is now all set for its first high-altitude test flight. After successfully completing a trio of Raptor ignition tests within four hours on January 13, SpaceX suffered three back-to-back -back static fire aborts last week. After the successful static fire tests on January 13, SpaceX replaced Raptor engines serial number 44 and 46 with new ones to prepare for the next round of tests. 
On January 20, SpaceX made three attempts to conduct a fifth-round static fire test, but was aborted each time. It's not clear what caused Wednesday's back-to-back -back test abort or whether they were actually wet dress rehearsals before the actual test fire. The fifth static fire then occurred on January 21, but was aborted shortly after firing the three Raptor engines, deeming it unsuccessful. 24 hours later, on January 22, SpaceX performed a successful full-duration static fire test, with all the three Raptor engines firing for about two and a half seconds. This was the most prolonged static fire carried out by serial number 9 since its first static fire test on January 6. With the sixth static fire test complete, SN9 is now ready for its high-altitude flight test. Serial number 9 is expected to flight to an altitude of 10 km, unlike SN8 which had an apogee of 12.5 km. A recent temporary flight restriction issued by FAA indicates that SpaceX will attempt the high-altitude test flight of SN9 on January 25. If the flight does not take place on Monday, SpaceX will attempt to fly SN9 on the 26th and 27th. Meanwhile, prior to SN9's static fire test, SpaceX rolled the latest Starship test tank, SN7.2, from the factory to the launch site. After arriving at the launch site, a team rapidly strapped the tank to the concrete pad and connected it to ground support equipment to prepare for a series of tests that will likely end with SpaceX intentionally pressuring the tank until it bursts. The previous Starship test tank, serial number 7.1, was successfully pressurized to failure in September 2020. SpaceX is believed to have reduced the skin thickness of SN7.2 by 25% in an effort to begin a weight reduction process. If successful, the burst test will open the door for future Starships to save weight by cutting steel skin thickness from 4 mm to 3 mm. The reduction from 4 to 3 mm steel rings could likely cut 5 to 10 percent from Starship's empty weight. And for SpaceX, every gram of Starship mass reduction translates directly into an extra gram of payload. Recently SpaceX has procured two former oil drilling rigs to act as the floating launch pads for future Starship missions. Dubbed Phobos and Deimos, after the two moons of Mars, they are currently undergoing refit for their new role. SpaceX has long speculated at potential floating launch and landing sites for its Starship launch system. The Super Heavy launch vehicle has a large blast danger area and poses noise issues if launched frequently near residential areas. Therefore, sea launch platforms will play a vital role in the launch frequency SpaceX plans to achieve with Starship. According to Elon Musk, these floating Super Heavy class spaceports will aid missions to Mars, the Moon, and hypersonic travel around Earth. Moreover, orbital launch trajectories are heavily affected by location, and a sea-based launch site allows the operator to optimize the rocket's payload capacity and reduce the cost for the mission. In July 2020, Lone Star Mineral Development Company, a subsidiary of SpaceX, bought two semi-submersible drilling rigs from Valorous for $3.5 million each. The nearly identical drilling platforms previously named ENSCO 8500 and 8501 are now renamed into Deimos and Phobos respectively. Both semi-submersible rigs have a main deck dimension of 73 by 78 meters. They are designed to operate in ocean depths as great as 2,600 meters and when previously configured as drilling rigs, had living quarters for 150 people. These kinds of rigs are either towed or self-propelled to the required site and are either anchored or moved by and kept in position by their own azipod thrusters with dynamic positioning. To dynamically position the vessel, the thrusters positioned in different areas of the hull work against weather and currents to hold a stable position. ENSCO 8500 series rigs are fitted with eight such thrusters and can supply 25 megawatts of generator power. Each of the oil rigs is also equipped with two Sea-Trax S90 cranes, which matches SpaceX's recent job listings. Deimos, which is currently undergoing modifications, is now at the port of Brownsville near South Texas. At the same time, Phobos was transferred from the port of Galveston to Pascagala to continue refitting the rig for Starship operations. There are several big challenges the company will face modifying these platforms for launches and landings. First will be the modifications themselves. These rigs were built around the idea of drilling for oil, so all of that infrastructure will need to be torn out. That's going to leave a big hole right through the middle of the top deck that will need to be filled. 
Next, they'll need to relocate anything in the way of building the launch platform, and that could include the small buildings that previously used to house crew and equipment. Finally, they'll have to build structures for their needs. Presumably, all of this will occur in the port of Brownsville and Mississippi. Moving on to the Starship build site, we have Starship serial number 10 fully assembled and standing inside the high bay. SN10 will be rolled out to the launch site soon to prepare for its high-altitude test flight. Meanwhile, Starship serial number 11 got its forward fins installed on its nose cone last week. The nose cone section will be stacked atop the barrel section in the coming weeks. The entire assembly will then be lifted and mated with SN11's thrust section, which is currently standing inside the midbay. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. Starship serial number 15, which is currently inside the midbay alongside serial number 11, got its aft dome sleeved last week. This sleeved section will be moved inside the midbay and will mate with the mid-lock section of SN15 in the upcoming weeks. The common dome section and the mid-lock section of serial number 17 were spotted at the construction site last week. The common dome that serves as the roof of the oxygen tank and bottom of the methane tank will be sleeved in the upcoming weeks. SpaceX has officially begun constructing its next Starship prototype, serial number 18. A newly upgraded thrust puck, marked for SN18, was spotted at the build site on Tuesday. The three central Raptor engines of serial number 18 will get attached to this thrust puck. The construction of super heavy booster prototypes is in progress at the shipyard. The methane tank section of booster BN1 is now almost entirely stacked and has only one stainless steel ring left. The forward dome of booster BN2 was spotted at the build site last week. This stainless steel section acts as the roof of the methane tank of the Super Heavy booster. Watch our previous videos in the playlist to get updates about the remaining Starship prototypes. Link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.